Hi everyone. This is quite a strange feeling to feel quite so much like I'm on home turf when moderating a panel. Um, it's a contradictory time for publishing at the moment. Um, we're told that print is dead, which I don't think is true, but we'll come to that later. Um, but at the same time, um, the independent, well, some independent arts publications are struggling to survive and having to cut budgets. Um, there's this huge growth of in-house um, content provision and um, the big galleries and auction houses are investing more and more in their own publications. Um, interestingly, Joe Kennedy um, said uh, just earlier today, he was talking about building um, value through storytelling and what better way to do it than through something like this. <laughs> um, and Alison McDonald, um, he's one of our panelists and panels today, um, she is the publishing director of Gagosian. Um, so I'll come to you first to introduce you. So Alison has been publishing director at Gagosian for 16 years, but comes from a family of printers, so print is very much in her blood. Um, she oversees, is it 400 gallery publications a year? No. no. Uh, ever. <laughs> <laughs> ever? Okay, I, I've written, I wrote that down. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I was about, well, you could, have, you could have taken it. And in 2017, she launched the Gagosian Quarterly magazine, um, which has a readership of around 50,000, I think that's right, which is about the same as the art newspaper as well. So that's kind of, it's pretty impressive. Um, and to my immediate left, it's Jane Morris, um, who is an editor at large of the art newspaper and was also an editor for almost a decade, but not at the same time as me. Yeah fortunately for you, um, but uh, she is also, she's written for many publications, including Mon Monocle, The Economist, The Guardian, um, but she's also a multimedia editorial consultant at Culture Shock, a company that produces um, magazines for clients, including Sotheby's, the V&A, the Tate, etc. Um, so she very much sees things from both sides of, of the fence. And JJ Charlesworth, is a writer and a critic who's seen senior editor at Art Review and has, again, written for many other publications like Art Monthly, Modern Painters, Time Out, Tate, etc., and The Telegraph. Um, and his history on, uh, sorry, his book on the history of British art criticism and art magazines during the 1970s will be published later this year. So he should be able to provide some historical context to this. So, Jane, I'm going to come to you first, because you look at the wider trends within the publishing industry, and um, from your perspective, what is going on at the moment? What changes and trends are we seeing within publishing? Okay, well, I mean, the, the impact of digital has been, I think, a kind of theme running through um, this, this conference for the last two days. And I think, I mean, there are many different areas of the publishing industry, and we'll probably end up discussing those in some detail, but I think that while I absolutely appreciate that there has been you know, very much an impact in the gallery scene and the art world, I don't think it's anything like the level of what's been going on in the wider publishing industry. I mean, from my perspective, we're now in the kind of third wave of the digital revolution. Um, the first one, for most of us, was a very positive one, and it's not the one that you tend to hear about so much. This is kind of the late 80s, early 90s, you know, uh, Emmanuel Peritan was talking about, you know, the era when we were sending transparencies back and forward, and you got information by phone and fax machines. Well, I'm sorry to say I'm old enough that I remember the publishing industry in that era. Um, nonetheless, the only reason I remember the publishing industry in that era is because desktop publishing software like um, Quark Express and then PageMaker, now we all use InDesign, but Quark Express and PageMaker were becoming available. And even more crucially, there were major changes in the pre-press process. Now, this might sound really nerdy <laughs> to you all, but with a few exceptions, a lot of the titles in the art world that you know today came into existence in that period. Because up till then, printing and publishing was so expensive that in general, it was only the really big newspapers that could do it. So there's no sort of surprise that the art newspaper came into existence in 1990, we benefited from greatly reduced production prices, so we could actually lay out magazines in-house, newspapers in-house, we could send them, and we didn't have to stand with a sub-editor on one side and a unionised printer on the other with a you know, hot metal, metal linotype machine uh, making up the pages. So the first digital revolution was sort of fantastic for us. The problem is the next two, which have great opportunities for us, 
but have knocked us sideways. Um, you know, the combination of the shrinking advertising, the impact of uh, social media, the uncertainty still amongst publishers about how far they can push subscription models um, has had, well, I think a profound impact. The Reuters Institute do a survey every year, about 200 of the world's biggest newspapers and publishers. And what they've described is a sort of, well, they call it a hollowing out, a hollowing out of journalism caused by these huge structural changes. Um, they, I'm sorry to say, to be doom and gloomy, <laughs> are predicting the biggest round of layoffs amongst the national newspapers across the, the, what, the world that we've seen in the past many years. And they paint a sort of fairly dark picture, and they raise the question, to what extent will the mainstream publishers be able to hold politicians and big corporations to account? Now, the report is very, very big, and there are bright chinks in it, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of that. But that's the general publishing background against which we're working. Now, in many ways, I mean, I think this was started, I don't know if you saw the article, I suspect this panel, I don't know, but I suspect this panel was sparked by a, a piece that Richard Polsky did yeah, in Artnet. Art isn't it? And he talked about um, the, the launch of Gagosian and some other magazines, but he also speculated about the future of what he called the big three. Um, the big three for him, I mean, he's American, the big three for him were Art in America, Art Forum, and art news. Now, as I say, I don't know what their balance sheets are, and he doesn't know what the balance sheets are. Um, I certainly know that in uh, our publishing industry, the arts publishing industry, we have to some extent been protected from the worst of this nightmare that I'm describing to you. Um, but I have many friends in the wider publishing industry. Unlike a lot of arts journalists, I did actually go to a mainstream post-grad journalism you know, training program. I went to one called City, where a lot of the people who work for The Guardian and the BBC go to. And I know, sort of from conversations with them, that this picture of constant layoffs, shrinking budgets, as I say, a hollowing out, is real. So that's the kind of starting point for me. Right. And JJ, with arts publications particularly, what are you noticing at the moment? Are there any discernible trends? As I said, it's something you've obviously studied in depth back to the 70s as yeah. well. Um, I mean, first of all, there aren't that many of them anymore. Mm -hmm. right? so, so to talk about uh, print is dead, I mean, it's, it's certainly the case that all the uh, titles I cut my teeth on that gave me the opportunity to start writing about art in the end of the 90s, right at the end of the 90s, um, they're all gone, apart from Art Review. And art Such Mo as? Art. Well, so, so I, I, I started writing for things like Contemporary Visual Arts. Um, Scotland had MAP. Uh, Modern Painters was relaunched. Um, and by and large, it's, so there's quite a string of publications. I hope it's not because I wrote for them that they <laughs> failed. But, <laughs> but um, it, it was very interesting that at the beginning of the 2000s, there was a huge uh, uh, moment of activity where investment was going into uh, relaunch uh, glossy art magazines. And uh, by and large, that doesn't, you know, obviously that um, managed for a time until uh, the wider advertising and commercial context, or the commercial context for art publications, started to uh, uh, be challenged. There's also the fact that the, num the subsidies to, to art publications, of which there was, there, there, there was a substantial, I mean, in, in Britain uh, in particular, there was subsidy for particular art magazines, which shrank also, which... which uh, Government uh, subsidies. Uh, Arts Council subsidies. Right, so, okay. so MAP, for example, was, was, uh, was very much, you know, that was uh, driven by uh, Scottish Arts Council. Uh, things like Circa in Ireland, all these things uh, were fell victim to uh, the withdrawal of, of public subsidy, arts subsidy. But in the commercial sector, um, I mean, it, I, I have to be quite careful about... Uh, the issue of the market. M art magazines don't tend to make money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so when we say print is dead, and there are wider uh, uh, industry, big industry uh, commercial contexts that are very important, and you know, magazine publishing uh, and the magazine, the print magazines uh, sector has shrunk year on year uh, over the last uh, 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 decade. So it's, it's, it's an industry thing, but. One has to remember that uh, art magazines are not necessarily published to make money. They are often backed by people who want 
to see art magazines happen. So if you look at the history of, of art magazines in the UK and elsewhere, um, broadly speaking, you find a, a, a story of interested collectors, uh, galleries, um, or other supporters uh, who want to see those things, uh, those publications exist. So if you, I mean, you know, we could go, there's a whole list of things I could, I could mention. It's also important to realize that uh, galleries producing their own magazines is not a new phenomenon. Okay, so if you go back to the 1940s, in France, for example, uh, once modernism be started to become uh, something to market and establish as a new culture, what you notice is that modernist, the big modernist art galleries, let's take uh, France as an example, set up their own magazines. They're not catalogues, they're magazines. So, for example, Gal uh, Galerie Macht uh, publishes Derrière le Miroir, uh, and there's a whole string of, of publications that are produced by galleries to both to... Uh, and this is where it's in interesting to deal with the ambiguities that we can talk about, both to, both to promote their artists, but also to produce a critical space and a, and a social and a, a publishing culture to, to offer a wider context uh, to so their they activities. Were, they weren't just covering their own artists? No, but there are, there are some broadly? issues there. Okay. Um, they were, they were some magazines principally uh, covered their own artists, mm. uh, but then there are, I mean, this is a potted history which does need to be kind of... Uh, uh, detail here, but it's interesting that in the post-war there have been there are constantly moments where people are setting up magazines uh, to promote not just their own artists but the wider context. In Britain, the, a good example is that Art Monthly, which is one of the longest surviving and most interesting uh, uh, critical, critically minded art publications, was backed by Jack Wendler, who was a, a significant uh, American collector who, who, who moved to the UK. Um, but also a thing like Artscribe, which is now, you know defunct uh, in in the early 90s, uh, was was initially backed. First of all, it was started by a, a group of artists, but then it was backed by uh, Waddington's Gallery. So, uh, and in our own experience, uh, you know, Freeze was backed by two uh, uh, wealthy individuals and did not make money for the first six seven years of its of, it, of its existence. And when it did, it was not you know huge. We're not talking huge sums. Similarly, Art Review, which is now uh, finally <laughs> having survived 70 years, we are so celebrating our 70th anniversary this year, um, was always backed uh, you know, through the, the, the difficult times by an interested uh, backer, collector, or, or group, of, group of backers. So I think it's important to uh, realize that actually there's a bigger issue at stake than just talking about money and media. And, and I think that's what we need to kind of pay some attention to because one thing I haven't sort of heard so much about so far in these sessions is actually, well, what is the cultural and critical value of the artworks and how is that value uh, figured out? And I think that's where we still need to have uh, a serious uh, discussion for the future. Right, okay. But also really that it's almost, what you're saying is a slight myth that there is an independent, we tend to pit it, the independent publications against those produced in-house, whereas the independent, the idea of a totally independent um, but yet also profit-making arts publication is. A myth. I think it's a bit of a it's a bit of a fiction. Right. I mean, okay. it's possible. I mean, you can mm. you can you can do everything you can to run a, a an effective, uh, efficient editorial business, uh, but uh, it is a small niche uh, sec sector of. Uh, a wider publishing commerce, uh, and it's not always done uh, f purely to, to, to satisfy the bottom line. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I mean, I think there's, there's more at stake uh, uh, than simply talking about whether the market is the thing which is destroying art publications, because in a sense, they were never properly, uh, you know, that many of them were not necessarily uh, bound to com commercial imperative in the first place. Instance. Okay, I see. Alison, moving on to you, um, what, why did you decide to launch this? And uh, you obviously value print still, and um, can you tell me a little bit about how this came, to, uh, came about? Um, well, the gallery has many artists and many locations, and so there's a lot that's always happening with our programming internationally. And I think there's, you know, an opportunity to give people the stories that our artists want them to know, whether it's um, context behind why, you know, why they're making what they're making or interviews with them or studio visits with them. Um, 
but we decided to make it really because we wanted people to have a sense of what was happening at our galleries internationally, really. Yeah. Um, it came from, we had made a journal for about five years before we launched the magazine, which was two years ago. So Was that a print? Just it was the print. journal was print? Okay. Yes. And what was the difference? Uh, that was a smaller format. Um, it did not have advertising in the beginning. Okay. Um, and it was more inward facing. It was really specifically about our programming. Uh, this is more about what our artists are doing in the world. It does cover our programming as well, but mm -hmm. we also have more... Um, interviews with filmmakers and uh, architects and musicians and, you know, other kinds of interesting... So who decides your, con uh, your content? <laughs> Me, mostly. Just, yes. just you, yeah. Uh, and, and my and team. Do you sort of get a clearance for it? I mean, do you, have to, do you have to take it to Larry and tell him what you want to do, or does he let you do what you like? Uh, I mean, we talk about it, uh, but no, it's mostly... Um, it's me and my team who are making most of the editorial decisions. Right, okay. And you do quite a lot of kind of Q&As and things with artists as well, um, less in terms of critical reviews, is that? Is oh that yeah, no, no, we try not to review our exhibitions or any exhibitions really. We're trying okay. to do, yeah, more um, engaging with the artists, lifting a little bit uh, of the veil of you know, the secrecy that everyone's, you know, always saying surrounds our gallery or any gallery and, um, and getting people a sense of this is how you install a massive, you know, sculpture and this is the crew it takes and this is the way they uh, handle the whatever trials they have along the way. And so just kind of these more um, insider things mm. that are happening. Is that, I mean, does that yeah, answer your question? No, it, yeah, it does, it does. And can I ask, how generous is your budget? <laughs> uh, it's expensive to make a yeah, magazine. Yeah, I bet it is. Oh, it's beautifully produced. I mean, this is heavy stock paper. It's yes. Every, it looks no, no expense spared. Yes. And I think this sort of thing always makes us so jealous when we look at, <laughs> look at publications like this. So it's um, generous. Yes, it's, a, it's generous. Yeah. Um, but... You know, I heard somebody here say, and I think it's very true, not a lot of people are making money in any kind of print. So we're doing print more to really, you know, let people see beautiful reproductions of works of mm -hmm. art. And that maybe is a bit different than what, the, you know... So is it profit-making? The magazine as its own as entity? As an entity? No. No, okay. You get some amazing... I mean, the advertising is really interesting to see how the luxury fashion brands obviously want to be allied very much with your luxury brand too, with Kogosian, that's sort of interesting to say. It's like opening up Vogue. The same, same with Ursula as well, with Hauser & Wirth's new publication. Yeah, I was really um, pleased when we started doing the advertising to see how many people really were excited about the magazine as mm. advertisers. Mm. That was a little bit of an unknown when we were talking about it two years ago. Yeah. It was exciting. And also that they're still valuing print as well. So I mean, that massive question of what is the value of print today? You believed in it. Jane, what do you think the value of print is today? Do you think people do value it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, think, I think people are well over... Well, certainly in the publishing world, I think people are over the, you know, print, digital... Well, over. <laughs> we're, we're wrestling with how to do it. We're wrestling with how to do it. But um, I think that um, we understand that print is good for certain things. Digital is good for certain things. You know, social media is good for certain things. Audio is better for certain things. Film is better for certain things. I mean, I think that's been one of the big shifts. I mean, it's ironic because I actually started in uh, film and TV, uh, uh, radio and TV, and actually became a print journalist. And it's interesting to see how we are all starting to think across those platforms more. But I mean, for art, I mean, in a way, probably one of the things that has protected us, certainly protected the art newspaper, um, in terms of its advertising anyway, um, is that um, you know, advertisers, particularly in the art world, still like print. Readers still like print, um, particularly because you know, it's, it's a great way to reproduce artworks. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's definitely places where print really works. I mean, but, you know, a lot of people see it as quite sort of luxurious, and people like the fact that it's got a start, middle, and an end. You know, you're not disappearing down a wormhole of a website. So 
you know, I don't think anyone now thinks print is dead. It probably is dead in the mainstream, at some point, in the mainstream news media. But even they are not certain about that. So we're sort of protected by being in a niche. Yeah, one of the things, yeah. Yeah, OK. And is it, is it more trustworthy? JJ, do you think that print is seen as being now that there used to be a dearth of information, now there certainly is not, there is so much being written. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a question now of attention span and also trustworthiness too. Is print, do you think people see it as being more trustworthy? I don't see that. The division is a, a, between print and digital there. Um, I think that it's important, what we, you know, I'm pre preoccupied with is the value of, uh, I mean, it's only two questions at the top of my notes here, is what is the purpose of critical publishing for the industry, for the sector, and for the culture? And the second one then is, if, if there is any purpose to it, is what is the model, the commercial model that can sustain it? That's all that, that's all that we really have to concern that ourselves about. One is a critical and, uh, and intellectual problem, uh, and the other one is, uh, is a viability, a sustainability problem. Um, so, you know, if, I mean, I think it's important, for example, to, to, to note that, uh, you know, a lot of art magazines uh, serve the function of, of circulating information for, for, for many years, right? Uh, and the internet, digital communications, has tended to entirely s replace the function of information circulation. So, notices about uh, exhibition dates, opening, so on, you know, gallery adverts that serve that function, um, and, and a wider kind of uh, space for, for, for the provision of, of the, the, you know, the transmission of information about a sector, what's on where, uh, who's doing what, and so on. All that has largely been taken away as a, as a kind of a revenue model or, or section of, of, of revenue within art publications. That's been, and that disappeared a long time ago, you know. Art review, art news and review when it started published listings, right? Substantial listings, so comprehensive, in fact. Uh, so if you look at art news and review in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, you have very, very uh, 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 systematic, or, you know, comprehensive listings of what was shown where, a record which nobody else holds, right? But all that has that has disappeared. The art newspaper still does it. Yes, um, <laughs> but uh, so so I think it's more to do with well, what do we want? writing about art to be for, mm. and who needs it. Now, I think, to be honest, uh, the, art, uh, the art sector, official art, contemporary art at the moment, really does need to reboot uh, its thinking about what uh, critical commentary and discussion and debate uh, is, is, is valuable to it for. I think it is very valuable, because essentially a lot of the kind of attention the galleries kind of paid to shifting to digital marketing and getting into social media and get, making sure that they were visible on all the platforms and was driven by a kind of a confusion, or kind of just we don't know what to do next, about how to get their presence, uh, to get themselves a presence in, in the field with the suspicion that nobody was noticing them. So, but, but at the same time, that has, all that has produced or has tended to produce is a huge amount of, uh, of information pushing. And a, a dearth of, of actually s supporting a sustained culture of discussion. Uh, so, I mean, I have a, m my issue with the in-house phenomenon uh, is that I don't see, unless I see a commercial gallery write, publishing material which is critical of its own artists, yeah. mm -hmm. right, then there is obviously a, 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 a deficit there in, for, the, for the wider culture. Right? And that's also, I think we have to kind of pay, not kind of just simply talk about the commercial, uh, the, the commercial galleries and their powerful shift to in-house publishing. We should also see that, you know, big institutions are publishing their own magazines, right? Tate, etc., the RA magazine, uh, the Art Quarterly. I mean, Tate, etc., you know, if it is sent to all its members, the membership for Tate, that's 140,000 copies. Right, because it's because that's the membership, that's the Tate membership, uh, and everybody gets a copy if you buy a membership to, to to Tate. So, what what that means is that big institutions also do this thing of narrating their programs, and it's very interesting, but uh, it doesn't have independence. So we're talking it's narration; it's not criticism. Well, it's promotional in, in, as, promotional in as much as it's promotional. Storytelling. It can't be critical, right? Mm -hmm. That would be my argument. Yeah. Okay. No, I get that. Um, 
I so think what is I sorry, mean, I'd like to yes, sort of just say because I think that I mean we're all coming from different perspectives. I mean I mean for me there's actually three questions. <laughs> one the first two are very um, similar to yours, JJ, which is you know, the first one is around independent news, art world news. So, you know, what's the value of that? The second one is how are we going to sustain that? We are not at the sort of existential crisis that I indicated at the beginning. And indeed, some of the big publishers are beginning to find solutions to that existential crisis. But the art world, the art news publications in, uh, you know, in, the, in the art world are very likely to follow in the same sort of footsteps. So how are we going to sustain independent arts news publishing if we think that's valuable? And then the third question, which is a bit different, is I think about how we are going to do different forms of publishing that engage wide audiences. Because while I'd love, you know, 150,000 people to read the art newspaper, that's not its target readership. It's focused on an inside art world. So w we are not the solution to reaching wider audiences. And I suppose the question for me is, and, and I would say this, I mean, I think that the magazines that say the Tate Do are one of the ways that people are reaching wider audiences. And I think I, I, I take your point very much, JJ, about criticism. But again, who are the specialist critical magazines writing for? Are you writing for a wide audience or are you writing for the same world that you know, the, the art newspaper writes for? Um, our ambition at Art Review is always to, to write for as broad a readership as we can uh, achieve by, just by being very clear about how we edit, right? So we have to we face both ways in that sense. So we are we are very attentive to the the uh, enthusiast market, the people who are really interested, mm -hmm. and we try to act as a kind of uh, uh, journal of record of some sort. But we are very intolerant of sloppy writing and jargon, right? That's that's and that's how you get people to. We like good writing. Yeah. Uh, it's not always easier to easy to achieve, but we like really good writing as much as we can. And who, who it and are edit your it. readers? Well, uh, our readers are the people you would expect. Uh, people who are between twenty-five and forty-five. Um, That's people, quite young. That's young. Well, That's very because young. it's the contemporary. Because the focus is on living art. Right? right. So, so as a rule, art review doesn't cover uh, dead artists. I'm sorry um, uh, to them, but um, <laughs> but we are trying to. Uh, leave a critical trace uh -huh. of of the present in the magazine, right. uh, and to do it in a way which is not purely repeating the notes of a press release. Right? I mean, we get we do get young writers who haven't learned how to see a show and then write about it without repeating the press release. Mm -hmm. Right? So they, even there, there are tensions about you know how how we make sure that actually our our perspective is distinct from simply PR or or, or facilitating PR. Mm -hmm. And do you get much feedback from your readers about what they want? Um, not much, no. Okay. So you <laughs> they, give them, they buy, you they give buy them the what subscriptions. They should want, yeah. No, I mean, I think there's a trust issue, and I think if you keep the quality strong, then, then it, it does, uh, does have some... The brand ha We've spent a long time trying to make sure that Art Review does uh, uh, achieve the kind of level of, of authority and also uh, accessibility that... <laughs> that we would hope for, right? Mm. There have been moments in Art Review's uh, long history where it's not been that good, right? But under the, our current sort of editorial project, if you want to call it that, we, we have done our best to set up something which is uh, attentive and enthusiastic about what's going on in contemporary art without being slavish and sycophantic. Mm -hmm. So that there is a bit of play there, you know? Um, so I think that's, that's important, and it's very important at the moment. I think that people are very, very eager for uh, discussion at the moment. Mm. It is a very strange time to be in. And when people say, well, everybody only re looks at Instagram and blah, 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 you know, they've got an att the attention span of a, of a goldfish or whatever, well, it's not really, it's not necessarily those people <laughs> that you want to be writing for. I mean, I've noticed that I'm reading more and more on this fairly mm. long form writing, mm. not necessarily in art magazines sometimes websites of our magazines, but I'm, I'm reading, you know, political commentary, social commentary, cultural commentary at length on what are quite ambitious independent websites, things like, I don't know, 
uh, the Atlantic or or mm. Quillette or uh, Jacobin is a very kind of left magazine that I'm you know I'm into. All there's all kinds of things that um, that are out there that are people. Are, you know, Eflux, for example, is a very interesting example. You know, incredibly influential uh, and online and very very uh, able to transmit very uh, extensive and in, and detailed and quite partisan theoretical texts about what's going on in contemporary art. So it's not the case that uh, things are impossible, but it is the case that we need to, you know, for me, we just need to be attentive to, to how to re regenerate or to develop this, this the, the, the culture of discussion and criticism and commentary and, and find a way to, to do that. And Alison, I actually have a question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> because I love print, don't get me wrong. I really I embrace print and I love print, but there is so much potential in online editorial. And in a way, what you do, both of, both of you, is sort of like not tied to print. In a, and you can... No, I don't feel it's tied to print either, I agree. It's, it's, it's about trying to deliver things in formats that make sense for what you're trying to do and which make sense for, for the reader. And obviously, the great thing about digital is it does make it easier for people to feed back to you. And to be honest, it also makes it easier if, if you have the systems to do this. And again, for those of us in the sort of smaller end of, of publishing, we don't have all the tools that the big publishers, you know, the New York Times and the Times, who I think are doing very good jobs with digital, we don't have yet the technology to be able to follow what people are reading as well. But that will come, and that will be a very useful indication of how people are actually engaging with our content. It, as I say, it makes it easier for them to interact with us, which I think is a good thing. Sorry. I <laughs> no, I, that's my... But it's like there's so much potential in terms of uh, how fast you can be putting things out, how... Um, yeah, how big the reach can be. I mean, I mean the speed, still, no, the speed yes. can have its problems, and we might come on to that later. Mm. But sorry. <laughs> yeah, it can do. How do your? Um, I mean, who first of all, who reads you? Who reads um, Caucasian Quarterly? Um, well, we have a large mailing list, and we okay. distribute so them. It goes to all your clients. All of our clients. Right. Yes, um, it goes to. I mean, we distributed art fairs. We're on newsstands. We're in museum bookstores. I mean, we're trying to get anybody who's interested in what we're doing in our artists. Um, and we do have an online magazine that we're developing as well, and we're doing a lot of video content for it. Um, and we're really trying to put a lot of that out there regularly on these various social media platforms, because that's how you get really the new audience mm. that doesn't know you yet. I'm in these yet. different platforms that you were talking about. So is that, how are you taking that approach at the moment? You do video and things, and I mean, do you have, do you have much data on who is consuming um, this content on different platforms and what they like as well? Um, I think we're, we have some of that, but it's mm. la we're, there's a lot of work left to do there. I mean, it's all still relatively new, the online magazine, and um, but we do have a lot of social media followers and we are trying to give them, you know, uh, storytelling moments about whether it's a specific single work of art or uh, an exhibition or something about why we're doing what we're doing. And it's, it's been doing very well in terms of getting people to the site, having people <laughs> stay on the site and stay engaged, like how long they're there. Um, and also increasing our social media following. It's, it's had a big impact there um, as well. Right, interesting. Um, and as you were talking about earlier, what stories people like, I mean, to be honest, when we look at data analytics on our website, it can be quite misleading. If we were to publish a story about Ai Weiwei, a cat, and Marina Abramovich falling down an Anish Kapoor sculpture. We'd yeah, break a, hole the in, a hole in the floor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so um, when we looked at all of our top stories last year, I mean, it was Banksy, Banksy being shredded by a million miles, and then it was Man Falls into Anish Kapoor sculpture, and then something to do with Marina Abramovich Abram well, as well. So it kind of it can be very misleading about what sort of content we should be providing. I think. The, I think that that's it's, it's, yeah, but it's always been an issue that people have say that, you know, well, you know, if you look at the, the most popular stories and it's going to be, you know, some of this kind of stuff, um, and therefore that's what we must publish. I mean, I don't think of it like that. I think it's much more, and I don't think any editor really thinks of it like that. Those things are just useful indicators. Having said that, this is what I mean about us not having the kind of software that more sophisticated big publishers have, because they're not 
just looking at that kind of stuff. Right. The headlines, I mean, that. They're, they're, well, yeah, but they're looking at what their subscribers are doing. So if you subscribe to the Times or the New York Times uh, or the Frankfurter Allgemeine or any of these, now I say I'm not an expert in this, but I do sometimes go to conferences and you know, feel a bit depressed because they've got such amazing sort of tech that they're trying out and you know, here are us with our <laughs> basic Google Analytics or whatever. Um, but you know, th th they, they're able to look at what readers are doing and feed that back to editorial, you know, their subscribers, in much, much more detail. Um, and then it's up to the editors to make decisions. And to me, that's not a great deal difference from you used to get letters pages. I mean, I think the art newspaper still does have a letters Maybe, page. Yeah. But, you know, and if you're at the Times, you get an enormous letters bag. I mean, I think there's two members of staff, two, two journalists full time every day deciding what goes in the Times's letters page. So they're looking at that. That's, that's another indication of you what your readers get think. Old school, do you have ye olde mailbag? Letters, you, letters? You do. No. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. send them in. That's interesting, because it's sort of, I, I feel like 10 years ago, people used to send far more letters than they do well, now. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, it, well, you get a lot of short emails that aren't really publishable as letters, because they tend to be <laughs> <laughs> just kind of short emails. Um, sure do. But, you know, you, you, people spend time doing forum testing of their readers. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can get okay. information from readers. And with, you know, I think with most things, it's, it's useful information for an editor. I mean, I don't think that you want to be working in a kind of silent thing where it's you and your thoughts and just shoving it out there and hoping everybody loves it. It's, a, it's supposed to be a sort of process of engagement. Um, but you still use common sense and, you know, I mean, if you, if you covered the art newspaper with, I don't know, Marina, I mean, it was kind of like an Ai Weiwei Central, I remember, for a short while. <laughs> it seemed there was an awful lot of stories about Ai Weiwei. Um, but, you know, if you do that, then it, it, it almost becomes a little joke inside the publication and you stop it. And, you know, mm. we know that that's not what readers want in general. So there is so much content out there. People's attention spans are getting shorter. What can you do to stand out? How can you get people's attention and make them read? JJ first. Ah, uh, well, I, again, I'm, I'm always a little bit nervous of uh, the, the, the kind of snap judgment that people are, there's too much content and people's attention spans, are too, all this. I mean, those arguments have been made every year since, like, the last hundred years, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You find these kind of arguments about the, the acceleration of information and the people's dwindling attention spans in the 60s, right? Um, we're always complaining that there's too much information and that people can't pay attention to it all. If you're interested, you slow down. And if you invest yourself, you start to pay attention to certain things. Right? I've switched off Facebook. I'm not interested in the conversations that are had there. I don't go on Twitter every day. Um, and I, I wonder certainly if those platforms are here forever. I can't, they, there's no law that says that Facebook and Twitter will be here, here forever or Instagram. Um, I think that what motivates me is to see when people try to set up uh, in platforms which sustain their interest uh, that they hope will build, uh, the, you know, develop the interests of others. Um, it's very difficult, but it's very much for you know that old kind of 1990s culture industry term, the prosumer, you know, the the, the pro-consumer, the, the the enthusiast or the person who's in, who's engaged. Um, it's those kinds, it's that readership that, that we want to be interested in. We want to make that readership too. And that does mean that we have to engage with people's curiosities and interests. But by and large, we are, what we are doing at the magazine is trying to track uh, and pay attention to where the, 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 the mood is. I mean, certainly in Art Review, there's been, a lot, there's been many years where we've, we've kind of looked much more closely at artists who are trying to deal with the social and the political uh, without kind of losing sight of everything else. But I think that's where we, you know, we, we're responsive, we try to be responsive to the general cultural mood so that we can prioritise uh, our attention in the magazine. And that does uh, have an effect in terms of sustaining a, you know, a, a, an identity to the brand for us. Um, and it's, you know, it is, it is a quite a precarious thing to have to, to kind of do all the time. But um, I don't, I mean, I have to say, the technology is something I would like to have more of, <laughs> right? Because it's expensive to invest in. Uh, and a lot of publications have, 
uh, struggled to, to make that shift. I think the last five years has not been the time to do it because essentially the big industry, the mass media industry dominated by the big techs uh, or, or driven by the, the development of the big techs are, um, you, you know, we're, we're innovating so quickly and with varied results that it was very difficult to actually be able to uh, uh, mimic or respond to those technologies and systems and innovations uh, in, a, in a way which was cost effective. Mm -hmm. So f for the last, you know, we've had to kind of hold back a little bit, uh, but we now see that there are, there's a sort of emerging, there's a shifting, uh, there is a shift now in everybody's trying to work out how to monetize. Right? And that has been the big issue for, for tech media or, or network media uh, content pr generators for the mm -hmm. last few years. And it's starting to get to the point where maybe we might see some, some ways in and out. You what know. are your thoughts well, on that? Well, I mean, uh, you can start, you're starting to see that lots of you know, young people are starting to kind of go to Patreon to set up the f sort of subscriber philanthropist uh, model. Um, uh, you're starting to, uh, you know, the Guardian is is making more and more money from its uh, donation and subscriber mm -hmm. system, right? Uh, so, and even though it's been losing, um, you know, money hand over fist uh, for the <laughs> last few years, but its its plan is to kind of, you know, try to push on that uh, on that. Uh, so on those developments. So it's sort of voluntary, pay so, so, uh, voluntary so rather than paywall. Yeah, I mean, I subscribe you, to things as well, right? So, do you believe in the voluntary? Um, well, approach, it's also interesting that paywalls, paywall technology and design has become a lot more subtle. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that also requires innovation and investment. Yeah, it's right? expensive. It's, it's good. Expensive, it's expensive. But it, and it requires uh, chief data officers. <laughs> so what does Art Review do? Do you give we all don't. your content on, uh, we, is it all at the moment? At the moment, we, give, uh, we, we tried a paywall, which uh, in, the, in the market was very uh, difficult to... To, to justify, right? Mm. Um, at the moment, we uh, sell subscriptions uh, to print, and we make uh, digital content free, but with a delay. Right. And for the time being, it's enough just whilst we try to work out how to make the next move, which is very tricky. Um, but uh, you, you know, it is interesting that pe actually just having a good subscriptions engine works. That sells, right? I mean, there are things that people, you know, go, oh, it's just, it's just selling online subscriptions. No, it's not. You, you, you know, all that business that people talk about, about frictionless journeys through the purchase, uh, you know, through, through subscriptions management and purchase, it's really important. It costs money. So, so we are looking, and also it's, it's, a, it's a moment where we, we do have to think about, you know, the next phase and the next investment, because we can see now, not only is the idea of an editorial platform in cultural and social and political commentary doing becoming a much more kind of important place for people to go and read. But it's also the case that there are uh, monetization technologies and, and ways of work uh, and, and methods which are starting to become a bit more sophisticated. And that is, you know, it's probably a good time now to, to start to put some effort into that. Okay. Um, I'm going to flip the subject now onto podcasts, which are another area of growth. Gagosian, you don't do one, right? We do no not. One. Have you considered doing one? I have ideas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we so really are doing a lot of video at right. the moment. So okay. we've been really focusing on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think as a visual arts organization, video has huge benefits mm -hmm. for being able to see the work. Mm -hmm. um, podcasts require a lot of time from the listener. And I think they have to really be engaging uh, in terms of... Um, like, I listen to podcasts because I really l am fond of the host or I'm super interested in the political topic or whatever it is, but I'm not totally sure if there's a podcast in the arts space that um, has figured out that chemistry. Right. So out of good, people like um, what David Zwerner, Listen Gallery, they both, There's a Sean lot of Kelly, podcasts that, art agency yeah. partners, um, the South of these owned. They're all trying people. different things. I think um, some of them are focusing on collecting. Um, some of them are focusing more on collaborations with artists and ex having conversations with artists. Um, they're interesting. Mm. Um, but longevity with podcasts, I don't, I'm not sure yet. I'm just personally not sure. So... Mm. Um, 
Well, but just that it is a format, the podcast as a format will continue to thrive. No, I mean in, in the art space, in the art because space. we're so visual in what we're trying to, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What do you think, Jane, on podcasts? Um, okay, so it's interesting, because I say I started in radio, and I am actually a radio four, radio three, radio four, BBC, radio three, radio four uh, addict. So for me, the idea that radio is popular is no surprise. And um, I think it's quite interesting that it seems to have taken about 30 years for people to realize that a, an awful lot of people <laughs> really like speech radio. Um, because a lot of what... Uh, there's been, again, a lot of research around podcasts, and there's no doubt that the audience for podcasts is growing. Uh, it's a young audience. It is in that uh, 25, 35-year-old age group that it's growing in. Um, so a lot of people want to, to get into that. Um, but it's a lot of what people, on a lot of surveys, what a lot of the people are calling podcasts are actually BBC radio programmes, and that's true in America as it is here. So, which is a bit of a long-winded way of saying, I think you could do really good stuff with radio, and I'm going to call it radio rather than podcast, but you know, whatever. Um, you can do really good things with radio, and the BBC shows, has, you know, really shows that. Um, what I think at the moment, though, is that there are rather a lot of very similar, not, you know, not particularly distinctive, long interviews, not edited very well or very much, uh, being put out, and there isn't. There's clearly a space for that, but I think it's already quite a, a crowded space. So I think if somebody was thinking of, you know, of, of launching that, <laughs> um, I think you need to think about. We need to think about much more innovative formats. Um, you know, I mean, this is. I don't know if you've heard it. Neil McGregor, you know, the ex-director of the British Museum, he did a series called The History of the World in a Hundred Objects, which is just speech, and you can go and look at the objects online, but you sort of don't need to. He, he, he describes them brilliantly. So I think there's space for different formats, but I definitely wouldn't put out, um, you know, well, I don't think there's much point putting out, you know, person A talking to person B, running it for 40 minutes. I think, mm -hmm. I think they need to have, uh, you know, more thought, more creativity than that in them. We need to go to Q&A in one minute, but can I just ask one question? We've spoken, obviously, you work for Gagos in pretty much the biggest commercial art gallery out there. We've got an audience with a lot of um, mid-level mid galleries in it. What, what could they do if you're a mid-level gallery and you're thinking about trying to do your own storytelling through content? Is there anything that if you haven't got the funds to produce something like this? Oh, so much. Yeah, what, I think there's a lot that can be done. What could they be doing now? Well, when you figure out you know, what it is that you want to say and what, what it is that you want to communicate to your audience and who your audience is. That is the beauty of digital technology. It's, it's, you can do it in very short form on social media if it's quality. It has to really be well done, I think. And by that I mean like just um, well informed, um, you know, Give it time. Don't just put things in the world flippantly. Like, really think about what it is you're trying to say. Do something in a series over a period of weeks. Keep people interested. Um, yeah, I think there's... You don't need to... to I'm very fortunate to be in a position to make a beautiful print mm -hmm. magazine, but it's the ideas that people are interested in. And if you have good ideas and you share them, I think there's so much potential. So it's images, ideas, quality, and... Regularity as well? I think so, things. yeah. Think of things in the long term. Don't just, you know, do this now and then do something mm -hmm. completely different later. Have some sense uh, of defining what it is that you are trying to do through this platform and people will respond. And a strong tone of voice. Does that play into or a sort of consistency of consistency, a voice? Consistency, I think, yes. Right. And humor. and Humor um, plays a part too, right? I think, yeah, there's... Having a little levity, it doesn't have to be so... Does Gagosian content have humour? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. It does, good. I <laughs> hope so. <laughs> Great. Um, right, we're going to have to go to uh, questions. So does anybody have any questions for us? There's one over on the aisle. Uh, it's for JJ. I'd like to know, like you were talking that you are fostering the criticism in at review. And the most read edition is the Power 100. 
So uh, I would like to know, like, it seems a little bit controversial, like, um, and also understanding because it's a way also to found like supporters and yes. Um, okay, Should I take that. Yep, take it. Uh, by the way, sorry for making your tote bag so heavy. <laughs> um, it wasn't our intention, but um, the Power One Hundred is one of the issues you've got. Um, I mean, I think the Power One Hundred is. Uh, an unusual thing for us always every year. Uh, it's the, our usual kind of uh, slogan is it's the way the art world is, not the way we'd like it to be. Um, and it's the one time where we look at the system very closely. I mean, it started out as a, as a kind of rather sort of euphoric uh, kind of boosterish feature that at the time when celebrity and status was very kind of uh, uh, coveted, you know. I think it's 14 years now uh, that, that it's been running. Um, and we've tried to make it a little bit more sober and a lot more uh, critical in the sense that it's trying to be true, uh, to provide a, quite a true picture of, of who is actually, uh, who wields influence. That's it. And the, inf and the criteria of influence that we apply to it are to do with um, commercial, institutional, and critical and artistic influence. Those are the three, those are the four, sorry, uh, criteria we bring to it. So um, it's, I mean... Who are they it, influencing? Uh, it's to do with, I mean, what we're interested in with the Power 100 is to, is to put on the spot, as it were, or to expose uh, or shine a light once a year, uh, and to, again, leave a record of the people who had, uh, who, were, who were influential, who had influence and power to make things happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what the Power 100 tries to do every year. So, I don't know, does that answer your question? Or are you asking that whether there's a problem with it? Uh, the listing as a solution, and all, uh, like uh, it seems uh, a little bit controversial in, in the terms of like, seems like a solution less about criticism, like uh, fostering that, and more like going to the solutions of like, of listing, listing, and that's what I thought. And I also like the, uh, the power one hundred. It's not clear like who are the persons who identify and it's um, and the idea of listing it's a little bit strange for me as well in terms of uh, philosophy and mm -hmm. yes that's why I mean just briefly uh, it, it may be our most popular issue and people like it uh, and the people who hate it most are the people who are on the list <laughs> uh, because they always have an opinion as to whether they should be on uh, at the position that they're at they're at uh, and we have advertisers who won't advertise because they're not on the list, right? Uh, and we get these weird emails every about, you know, no, uh, September from galleries just happening to tell us <laughs> how much they've done this year. Uh, I'm interested in that. So. How much pressure do you get, with the Power 100 particularly, how much pressure do you get from your advertisers? Uh, we don't. We don't. We get, we know people have withdrawn their advertising because they've come off the list. Okay. The rest of the time, everybody tolerates it. Do they go back on the list then or not? No. No. Not unless, they unless they've done something more than they've done the previous okay. year. And do yeah. they come back again? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah plenty okay. of times. But so again, it's, it's not driven by... And in fact, we are very, very... It's a short toys out of the pram moment and then... There are some longer periods of... Of, of toys staying yes, out of the pram. Yes, toys being thrown out of the pram, okay. yeah. Any more questions? For the moment. Georgina. Could you explore a bit more the question of advertising and the impact and the influence of advertising on uh, particularly yeah. and PR as well? Yeah, that was one question we didn't get to is that um, the question of kind of conflicts of interest as well. I think it's too well, I think what you're coming from is that there's two elements there. There's sort of PRs and friendships with PRs as well and advertising and pressures from advertisers. Um, JJ, what are your, I think you mentioned, when we, sorry to come to you again, we mentioned um, when we were on the phone, I think you said the Art Review had quite a strict code of conduct yeah. when it came to these things. Could you I mean, explain a bit about that? Well, I mean, I don't want to get too kind of grouchy about the internal politics of these things. 
PRs have, have expanded, right? Mm -hmm. the, the market for PR has grown and grown and grown. That has always been a bit of a bug, bug for us because it means that people's budgets, gallery budgets, are redirected to intermediaries rather than us, uh, to, to our advertising. Um, it means, therefore, that we have a, there's, a, there's a relationship of some tension, uh, not because of, just because of that, but because we don't see why we need to be sold to because we make the decisions about what we think is good or bad. So things like, uh, and what we want to cover, so things like press trips have to be very carefully uh, regulated. You know, we don't take press trips unless we are already intending to cover, so it facilitates us, and we won't sign up to press trips that, uh, where there is a condition of coverage. Simple right. As that. Press trips are a difficult one because also if you, if you do take press trips, which let's face it, most publications you have to because you wouldn't be able to afford to go to, I don't know, Taiwan or wherever, and also if you're a freelance journalist, do you have to be born with a silver spoon in your mouth in order to be a no, journalist, no, I, well, in order to pay I, your way around the world? No, I mean, just to say, I mean, uh, we, we don't. We accept press trips when it's something that we want to do anyway. Right. And that it facilitates us covering what we want to cover. And obviously, inevitably, there is a useful relationship uh, to be had with PR, certain PRs, who actually bother about the, the culture of the magazine. That's mm -hmm. the other thing. Uh, and know what we want. So good conversations with PRs are very useful. Uh, random email spamming PR companies uh, are that are trying to, you know, that are staffed by a hundred, you know, uh, minimum wage uh, kind of uh, account, uh, you know, account salespeople trying to kind of get through to you and saying, "What well, are you interested in this?" Well, it's like, well, no. I think most of those go through um, in the bin. I know. But the real, but but it is also true that because that has developed that the way it has, uh, the kinds of PRs who will entertain a sensible discussion with you and a long lead discussion as well. So, you know, we need to know from you what the likely uh, program uh, of your gallery clients is going to be so that we can plan. That's good. Okay. And that's always been good. Jane, what would you say on these maths? Oh, I was just going to say that most publications, I mean, I can't speak for the other arts uh, news titles or platforms, but I imagine it's very similar. Um, should have a code of a uh, set of guidelines around these matters and they, the art newspaper has one and um, it's I'd say there's, there's kind of two main areas and one is the kind of I call the sort of internal pressures that's that's all the stuff that's around your friendships, you know, your business relationships, I mean, those kind of things. And that's all around issues of, you know, disclosure and editors being careful about, you know, if you are constantly covering... Um, uh, if you're constantly covering activities that come from the same PR company, I mean, that's part of an editor's job is to be keeping an eye on that stuff. And then there's the stuff that I think of as more as the external pressures, and that's things like um, advertisers putting pressure um, on, you know, it'll be a different, it won't, it won't usually be directly on editorial. The pressure, you know, will go in some other bit of, uh, of the business. Um, and, you know, uh, because they don't like a story or whatever's happened, um, which, you know, in the news media, it's often people don't like a story or they don't like a point of view. Um, then, again, the company should have sort of codes of practice mm. for dealing with that. I mean, this is the kind of... In the news media, it's the kind of everyday... You know, this is an everyday issue, and, and you should be sort of well prepared for it, and it should be something that is discussed periodically within the company. How about one area that I think is particularly interesting is catalogue essays as well. A lot of journalists write catalogue essays. Is that... Is that the same issue of disclosure? Yeah, if, it, if it's full dis disclosure, I mean, if, you're, if you disclose it, then it's OK. Um, OK, well, so it's not, such, so not quite so relevant for most people at the art newspaper, but, no, I mean, disclosure means that... I mean, it can mean a number of things. Um, it could mean that, you, you know, you tell the editor when they want to make the commission, the editor will then have a discussion with you about whether or not you're the right person to take that commission, number one. Mm. Number two, um, you might take a commission, it might be accepted, and it may be decided that, you know, something's got to be printed in the paper. So there's no like totally hard and fast rules, but it's it's a it's a question of discussing with the writer whether they should be the person okay. writing that article Navigating or not, it. or whether that commission should be given to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And it's you know it, you you could you could be married to a gallerist, and you know that happens. Journalists do yeah. actually end up married to gallerists, <laughs> or you know, and and so you just need to think about those things. Mm. But it's but as I say, it's a it's a routine part of a professional, uh, independent publishing operation. Mm. This Alison, kind of stuff. Do you get 
pressures from advertisers? Sure. Not really, no. <laughs> Listen. I'd rather want your job. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I suppose you're not writing not about covering, you're not yeah, writing about your when advertisers. You, when exactly. you take advertising from a totally diff a, a different pool, pool altogether, exactly. then you're never going to be writing it. Yeah, it's maybe what we should all do: all just have luxury <laughs> fashion advertising to avoid the avoid the pressure. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Mm, oh, one, one there. Just listening to you all. Thank you. Um, there seems to be the economy of storytelling is sort of eclipsing the economy of journalism. And there's a conflict there. I can hear it and see it in you. I feel conflicted. I think the catalogue essay versus journalism. Is there some sort of mechanism going forward where that can be addressed? And I think there's a wider issue in the world. So that's just my question to you in terms of the economy of storytelling and how it's... Did you want to ask that to any um, one of us in may particular? Well, maybe in a way, to Jane, because, um, for example, do you edit all... Of, once you've commissioned a, a journalist to do a story, is then that edited by you, or does it go directly online? OK, no, so I should explain that I'm, I'm, I'm no, no longer the editor of the okay. art newspaper, yeah. but I can certainly speak to how... Yeah. Because the way it works is a very standard way of working. I think, I think the economy point, I would also like to say, for me, the, the issue for me is that... I do believe that we need to invest more in our journalism. So the sort of frustration and sort of uh, angst you're probably getting from me on the independent side is that I actually believe that we need to be doing better journalism now, better than we're, we're doing. I think we need to be more and more relevant to our readers. And a lot of the things that I think are most relevant are expensive to do. You know, whether it's, I, whether it's doing a really good profile interview where you sought a lot of background views and did a lot of in-depth research, whether it's investigative stories, uh, wh whether it's even something very beautiful where, you know, in a more consumer mode where you've actually filmed your interview with the artist and you can put up a beautiful gallery of their works, whatever it is. So, so that's where it's coming from for me, is that there is an imbalance between what the, um, I suppose, the in-house uh, sector is able to pay and what we're able to spend as uh, you know in, in, in the independent now I say I obviously do both sides so I know that it's it's uh, you know which you know where where there is more funding um, and you were asking about editing stuff no I mean the the everywhere I work there is a really careful editing process so there would normally be there would be an, a piece would be edited, it'll be sub-edited, it'll be fact-checked, it'll then be proofed usually by two or three more people. Uh, and that's whether it's going... It, it, it's slightly less processes if you're going uh, online because you don't have to fit onto the page. And fitting onto the page is a bit of a slower process. But it's essentially the same for digital as well. Yeah, I think the art newspaper, I mean, there are certain... We certainly uphold that sort of standard. There are other places... I won't mention any names, but I did work for a glossy magazine where quite often you would have written, subbed it, laid it out, everything, and then proofread it yourself. Which that does, well, I had to explain what a sub-editor was to my boss there. And that is just really... So, the, and, so and, then and you go back... You and know, journalists notoriously like can't cut themselves. Uh, I mean, no. if, I, if, I'm, you know, if I've written an article and I'm really invested in it, I can't see that it sh could be a third shorter and it'll be better. Mm. And, and, and if you're convinced something is right, you're convinced it's right. So, I mean, this is why these processes are important. Yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting. I like your point about storytelling versus journalism. I think that... Story I think there's a valid place for both of them. The storytelling you want when you're going to... I think Richard Polsky said something about um, opening up Gagosi and Quarterly and turning on some jazz and kicking back with a <laughs> glass of wine. That's, there's a place for that. But then there's also... And I don't think that storytelling it's telling is in any kind of danger. What I fear most for um, at the moment is good investigative reporting, which frankly isn't... Well, it's fun if you enjoy that kind of thing. It's very, very labour-intensive. But, but it's and time, it should but cost... It's, but it's, it's, time, it's time for yeah, everything. If you want to do a really everything. good artist interview, you don't want to end up with half a day's research, an hour in front of the artist, and half a day... Yeah. to write up. Yeah. That's not ideal. You need the time, but, and you also need the time but to pay these well, people in fact, to do it. Well, you see, the two well. at the front are actually saying that, that, that my colleagues are saying, you know, that, that sounds that's quite a long lengthy. <laughs> you know, so, so that's the kind of issues we're talking about. 
but I think that's, I mean, we haven't actually spoken very much with Melanie and Georgina, sitting at both previous art market editors at the Art News Sofa, and I think market writing is actually, that's what I do, what we do, but we haven't actually spoken that much about it. Um, and that's another beast altogether to criticism. Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, these investigative pieces, I, uh, they're brilliant to do, but they take a long time, and you really need, to, you should be paying good money for them But this as is well, what people value as well. You know, if, we, if, we, if we want readers to take us seriously, mm. it's this kind of more in-depth, I mean, you're talking about more critical thinking as well. Mm. Again, I mean, if a reviewer is very young, hasn't seen a lot of shows, and is given, again, half a day, to write something, then it's not going to be the same as somebody who's been thinking and looking and discussing art for 20 years and you know, has time to really investigate an artist's work. I, mean, I do think there's, there's a big confusion amongst pretty much everybody in the sector. Uh, you know, how many galleries take out an, an ad in a, in a magazine? Uh, you know, I'm not going to ask you to put up your hands. Um, but the fact is that, you know, it's more the issue, do you want to create spaces where there is some other voice trying to deal with what we're all dealing with? Because otherwise, what you end up with is a system where the power that dominates the uh, institutions produces the stories. I mean, it's not very complicated politics, okay? Uh, this is why small galleries early on in the kind of like, you know, in the kind of more active and dynamic period of of like, first of all, kind of post-war modernism, uh, the reception of post-war modernism, and then in the 70s and 80s, the reception of post-modernism, whatever we want to, uh, however we want to term that, you know, uh, we're actively producing publishing spaces and supporting publishing spaces where those debates and those questions were being aired and developed. And one of the major th reasons that people set up art publications is because the discussions they want to have are not being had in public in what, is already, uh, in what already exists. Now, I, I appreciate that the middle market is feeling the squeeze, uh, but it was always difficult to get adv uh, advertising out of galleries because galleries forget that it's not about information, it's about discussion, right? And that to, su to support those spaces is to support the life that informs how the art makes sense. I mean, I do think at the moment that uh, we do have a situation where people are so obsessed with the commercial uh, realities of the market, and uh, as well as the problems of, uh, tra of disseminating one's own uh, program and presence and activity, um, that they think that just because they tell the story in a press release or in a catalogue essay or in an, in an in-house magazine, that means that that's the story, that other people will just buy it. Right? You do need some space for improvisation and trying things out and having different voices argue over what it means, right? That's otherwise you don't have, there's no purpose to criticism. If, if we knew what it meant, you wouldn't need criticism, right? It's a theoretical problem. But the reality is that culturally, if you have just people telling you all the time, this is what my artists do, this is why it's great, right? And no space in which that is actually tested, you know, uh, assessed, argued with, disputed, whatever, or, or, or confirmed, then the whole culture becomes more and more uh, uh, kind of sclerotic, if that's the best word, it becomes atrophied and becomes, you know, it loses its life, right? So I think there is a moment now where we do, you know, we, I think it's very interesting to, listening to, to Elizabeth talk about the independent, you know, the idea of really thoughtfully reconstructing or, re, or relaunching or, or, or re, you know, uh, coming back to the issue of what discussion do we want to have, what stories do we want to debate and dispute and argue and confirm, and who's, who's going to do it? Because the problem is, it's always the problem, structurally, if you are the seller, you are only going to say good things, right? Sorry to be blunt about it, but that's it. And it is, neither, it is not the case that the internet or social media or millennials alters that principle one atom, right? Iris Claire, the, the uh, French gallerist, launched her newspaper called uh, Iris Today, 1962. It ran for f 15 years or so. She, I was reading a very interesting essay about it. She uh, and many other gallerists who had, were pu publishing their own uh, print publications uh, were trying to get their publications, their periodicals, licensed by the press, the, by the state licensing uh, uh, the, the, the ministry. Uh, and 
uh, a letter came back to her saying, very sorry, uh, we, can't, we can't license uh, Iris today as a, uh, as a newspaper periodical because it is essentially propaganda for your, for your gallery. Now, she obviously kind of had, uh, didn't like that, but the point is that's, that's the problem. The problem is where is, where is commentary and media and what does it, you know, wh where does commentary actually enhance the general culture uh, that we are all Can I bring with. Alison in there as well? I mean, so we're sort of talking about, you know, what's your view on injecting some light and shade into gallery publications? Do you think it's their place or not? Um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, we cover the artists that we believe in, mm -hmm. and I think that there's so many stories that can be told or, or contexts that can be given for the different work that they're making that... Um, there's a place for a critical discourse on the show, and there's also a place for this is what's happening in the studio before the show. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... Sorry, the great, what was the question? Sorry. <laughs> well, just really whether you feel like there is a place for the sort of... We're talking about light and shade, whether there's a place for shade within within uh, gallery publications, whether you think that should be... I mean, it says Gagosian on the cover, yeah. right? So it's we're pretty, pretty clear. forthcoming with yeah. what... Um, in, it is, and so I think you know if you are opening it by default, you're understanding that there's mm. a set of principles here that um, so sort of maintaining a kind of neutral voice. Okay. Well, there's a there's a long history of whether it's museums doing their own museum publishing mm. or brands doing their own brand publishing. I mean, you know, Waitrose famously has its own yeah. magazine, and people who buy Waitrose know what they're getting. You know, they, they don't expect to get a critique of Waitrose. They expect to get nice <laughs> recipes, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 that, and that's perfectly valid. Um, mm. I, think, I think, the as I say, the, the, the concerns are coming for those of us that are in the, 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 the media that are, is, uh, is in a more precarious position, but my argument, and that's why I started where I started, is that my argument is that those of us in the independent media um, who, who are having, you know, facing these difficulties, that's not the fault of you know, Gagosian or Tate, etc., or whatever. That's the fault of the really big, massive shifts that are, have been washing over us for 20 years in the publishing industry. We haven't got to talk much time to talk about solutions, and the, 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 some are coming by the looks of it. Well, I mean, I think one of the... As I say, we do need to invest in, in the journalism. If we, if we don't produce a really good product, nobody is going to want to read us, and we're not relevant. So that's my biggest concern, is, mm -hmm. is trying to make what we do better and more relevant and engaging our readers. I mean, I'm hoping, and I guess other publishers are hoping, that, uh, that this will partially at least be managed by the very welcome sign that more people are willing to subscribe to things than people thought. Now, we don't know how far we can push that model, but I think that I think we can probably all generally... Well, perhaps, no, you can't. Those of us in the business, though, can generally agree that high-quality journalism pumped out free-to-air with the hope that it would be ad-supported, and then, of course, it wasn't ad-supported because what advertising there is online is going to the social media platforms, yeah. was as it turns out, a somewhat disastrous but understandable strategy. But I take quite a lot of hope from the fact that, you know, I subscribe to eight or nine things, and I think that we will probably see something similar okay. starting to happen amongst, uh, certainly, I think, the news, the arts news publishers. Um, so, you know, I guess we're going to hope that readers will believe in us and will support us by subscribing to us, which in a weird way is a, is, is, is a more comfortable relationship, actually, than relying on... Advertisers. advertisers. But the truth is, it, you know, we're going to have to diversify business as well. Okay. I would expect to see conferences, events, training, you know, data research. I mean, whatever you can do that takes your intellectual capital and uses it in some way that helps support mm -hmm. publishing is JJ, what I would expect. JJ, what would you expect. say in terms of a sort of a snappy solution? <laughs> well, uh, Jane's point about diver diversification is, I think... Uh, key or, or very important, it's certainly important to us. So we are taking the Art Review brand and ethos and doing other things with it. So we're organizing conferences or, or panel discussions in, in partnership with events. Uh, so we've been running a, a program of, of discussions at Child Art Fair in Copenhagen, I think now it's the fourth year. Um, and things, th that model is very sensible because it's, it's taking, as you say, the intellectual capital or the cultural position that you have anyway as an editorial 
and you send it into a different format in a different uh, situation. And it, it can be, uh, it is a commercial proposition. Um, I still think that we need to look at the next move in uh, digital platforms and digital reading. I don't believe that people need to listen up to podcasts about things that they can see on a screen. Right? I totally take the point, but it's a bit mad to, to publish lots and lots of podcasts uh, that you, with people describing something that you could have a picture of. So, but I do think that that's going to uh, move, and we need to be ready to push into that uh, uh, soon. Um, and I think that you know, just the, the general diversification of how people are prepared to support things is, is, is really uh, clearly an opportunity now. The other point is, don't forget that the advertising revenue-based model, which Jane alluded to, is going to be under a lot of pressure, is already under it a already lot of pressure. Is. Regulation is going to cause a lot of trouble uh, uh, and is already causing quite a bit of trouble. And I have a friend who runs a quite a successful news aggregator website, but he's waiting for the moment where regulation starts to impinge on traffic and, and how revenue is, is uh, uh, generated from you know, ad spots. There's also kind of weird technical things that are going to come along too, which we have to be aware of the, uh, at the regulatory level. You know, Facebook and, and Twitter are obviously under a lot of pressure. They're not going to last doing what they do the way they do it forever. But also things like, uh, you know, the EU's regulations that they're proposing on copyright and link, so the, the so-called link tax, uh, is very, very under the radar, but uh, things will come along to bite uh, the, the, even the kind of big revenue models um, uh, uh, that are current. So things will change too. And I suspect it will move to, uh, we will look, see the emergence of a much more kind of uh, involved uh, supporter readership uh, system. So we're going to consumer driven well, again almost. Well, it's, it's a bit different actually. I think it's going to be very exciting because it's going to be people who actually believe in you. Right. Yeah. Pay, paying, you know, t paying you a little bit. If we're good enough. Yeah. If we're good enough. Yeah. So, what would you agree with that, Alison? Is it to, to finish up that the priority should really be well, audience over advertisers, I suppose, as well in some ways. We're also advertisers. I well, you mean, are. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, yeah, we found a lot yeah. of yeah. advertising, <laughs> and you um, and you um, I mean, you were involved in that as a well. Lot yeah. Of that, yeah. So yes. you do both sides. Yes. But um, in terms of um, publishing... We see value in advertising. Side. I mean, there's still huge value in the audiences that are paying attention to the art newspaper and mm -hmm. art review and a lot of magazines. And we're also doing more mainstream advertising in the New York Times, the Financial Times. Um, and we see results from that. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's still... I don't know, I'm like the eternal optimist or something, but I think there's still a huge value in in those... Um, you know, spending money in that way uh, for for the gallery. Yeah. Um, so this is in no way a sort of replacement for for advertising more broadly around it. You still need that no, breadth we've, of I, media. No, we've continued or increased our spend in other... Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Right, well, we better... It's lunchtime, so I don't want to hold you up. It's one twenty nine. So <laughs> thank you so much um, for listening. Thank you for coming. So I'm